Um, I'm Alan Simpson, and this is the last of the talks that I've done for Nottingham University on the climate emergency that we're knee deep into. Uh, and to try to pull it together, what I th think we have to do is to look at the cultural shift that needs to take place that reverses almost everything that has happened in my own lifetime. I was born as a citizen. Didn't matter what income my family had uh, or how much I had. I had rights as a citizen. <clears throat> Towards the end of the, the 70s, that was changed politically in the UK when Margaret Thatcher redefined the priorities in terms of me as a customer. And as a customer, I was both individualized uh, and the precondition of being a customer is you had to have the money to purchase. Whereas as a citizen, I had rights as of birth. And those rights were common rights, not just personal ones. To address and reverse the climate crisis that we face, I'll manage our way through it. We're going to have to cut our carbon emissions by 10% a year. And to do so, we require both a new economics and a new sociology of what is our purpose on this planet, uh, which is the only one that we've got. And to do that, we have to move from our obsessions about individualism and to see the securities that come from a different politics, which has us uh, understanding our interdependencies. And those interdependencies are, for me, the basis of a real security for tomorrow. <clears throat> There's no end of literature around that, that can bring this home, whether it's the writings of James Lovelock or Naomi Klein <clears throat> or of those from uh, Yuval Noah Harari uh, about what we are as a species and whether it is still within our grasp to deliver something that allows us to survive in meaningful uh, and nourishing ways. And it is possible, but not without genuinely transformative change. So now the good news is that only the radical is reasonable. Everything else it just remains part of the problem. So we, we have to start thinking about what we're consuming and the money that comes into absorbing goods from halfway around the planet with zero responsibility for the carbon footprints that come in or the depletion of other people's lands and landscapes that are part of that process. The richest on the planet at the moment, those who are uh, the big corporate owners of wealth who have benefited most from today's economics are chasing fantasies. The notion uh, of an arc in space, the, 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 the fact that there should be safe places once somewhere out there once we've rendered here uninhabitable, is just bonkers. Uh, and it's interesting that even in the propaganda that they put out about the idea of an arc in space has, you know, the, it, it is policed. If you look at the bottom of those images, the rest of us are being policed for uh, once the, the, the chosen get onto this arc in space. It, it, it isn't... It isn't credible. It is a distraction, a dangerous distraction that allows for the continuing acceleration of the destruction of the only planet that we have. <clears throat> the other bit about the trips to Mars is that th there are no Flash Gordon alternatives that were there in, in my childhood as a, as a piece of space science fiction. The, the reality is even the, the super rich are chasing now is the notion about whether they can construct sort of bunkers on this planet with some sort uh, of security force to protect them from the hordes that might want to come and share something of the food supplies that they may have stacked up for themselves and whether they can be on. This is not, uh, this is not any vision of a future that the vast majority of us can have any place in. And the fantasists that chase this are offering not only illusions, but they're offering the idea that it's only that sort of totalitarianism of the richest and powerful 
that is worth putting any resource into. My own view is this, if, if we have the money to do this, we have the money to actually restore our own soils and repair our natural environments and construct a different economics where social purpose and social inclusion are the starting points of where we might all hope to find a place to survive. <clears throat> so some of this can be visionary for nature as well uh, as visionary for design. And I think we need to look at some of the examples uh, of the constructions of ideas that architects and designers are coming up with in terms of uh, you know, the urban environments where places for nature can be inspirational as well as reparational. And that's what we can be doing. I think we have to unleash the creative powers of the generations of young people coming through, the designers that we have, the architects, the planners, but it needs to be visionary and reparative, not just based on the consumption uh, of what we have today, leaving the notion of the disposal of the consequences to the generations that follow. And if we look at examples that can be found of how and where that's been done, Nottingham is a really good example because in 1830, Thomas Hawksley, who was then a sort of young borough engineer in his, in his mid to late 20s, had a look at water supply and thought, this is, it's not good to be uh, drinking water that people will do their washing in and pee and poo in as well. And he created um, a pumping station and a supply network just outside Nottingham um, that drew as a, from the reservoirs in Derbyshire through to the pumping station in Papawick, just outside Nottingham, <clears throat> and provided a clean water supply into the city itself. It was the principal reason why Nottingham almost uniquely uh, was was largely untouched by the cholera and typhoid outbreaks uh, that devastated communities around Britain uh, at the same time. And why? It was because they, the segregated clean water supply had been put in place by this visionary process that se separated and delivered a clean water supply. How did they do that? Well, they issued bonds and people put in uh, five pounds, 50 pounds, five shillings, <clears throat> whatever, to, do, to finance the construction of a safe water supply. And as a result of this, his work here in Nottingham, Hawkley went on to do the same sort of thing in Glasgow, in uh, Bristol, in London. He was commissioned all over the place. But it was based on the notion that somehow you moved from individual freedoms to you know, dip into water supply of, of rivers and streams uh, with no notion about what you also dumped in them. But instead, the collective provision of a clean water supply that would provide safety uh, and supply to whole communities and whole cities. And we, we were doing the same in terms of energy. We moved from individual uh, notions about chopping down trees to provide iron heating to the provision of common collective energy systems that provided the municipal basis of energy companies that existed in Britain right up until the mid 1940s, all of which were funded through municipal bonds and the profits from which went back into municipal provision that provided libraries, swimming baths, museums, parks and gardens. <clears throat> so it was the socialization of gain at the same time as providing the safe saving spaces that, uh, that underpinned the how of funding that transformative change. And exactly the same choices are possible for us today, but we just have to have the vision of setting out how we do this and reclaiming the notion that not only is this affordable rather than unaffordable, but it is imperative if we want to survive. I mentioned in a previous 
session that in Nottingham, we also had a, an, an integrated, extensive public transport network for trams and trolleybuses in the 1930s. We could do exactly the same in ways that currently you have towns and cities across North America and across Europe delivering integrated clean transport systems that aren't based on planning line by line, but a whole integrated joined up thinking about how communities and citizens can move collectively and securely and in our context cleanly in the, in the decades that follow. And it also ties into the previous session, what we were saying about the 15 minute city last mile deliveries um, are already being pioneered uh, in other parts of Europe where whole delivery systems uh, are being uh, underpinned by bicycle delivered, uh, driven uh, delivery systems or EV battery ones on a scale that just moves goods about, recognizes that we have to provide the goods and services that community lives depend on, but they don't have to be done in ways that either are polluting or congesting and, and which leave neither the citizen nor the economy poorer as a result. The notion as well about how we fund that public provision just seems to be absolutely pivotal. One of the crazy things for me is that you can see around Europe this notion about 100% free public transport is already part of the political landscape of conversations about what societies and communities need to survive. Uh, but we should be doing the same in relation to the trains. It is perverse in the extreme that in the midst of a current crisis, uh, or, or in terms of the pay for those running the rail services, the, the irony is that you know, train services and schedules may be disrupted massively, but the one thing that hasn't been disrupted is the arrival of dividends and profits. Uh, and it begs the question of why in the, in the context of the current environmental existential challenges that we face, why shareholders, the interests of shareholders should still continue to supersede the interests of citizens when it's gonna be citizens that are gonna to have to work out how they survive the future. And if you want to finance it, go back, let's revisit the notion of municipal bonds to finance social provision that, that itself underpins the notion of clean and sustainable existence. And we're going to need to follow the examples of those in Luxembourg, uh, where transport, boat transport is free, but also in Germany, where you have low cost regional quarterly payments that uh, people can have, which gives them free access or that, or that access, unlimited access to regional transport services. So the notion about being able to uh, have access to that as citizens that allows us to do things that are interconnected and viable and don't throw us back to the notion that unless I actually retreat into my own car, there isn't any way of getting to or from work, to and from the cinemas or cafes or whatever that we need to visit to, to be part of a, a viable socialized existence. So it's, it's all doable. The question is just how do we finance it? And it isn't a shortage of money, it's a shortage of political will and wisdom that actually draws the money from where it already exists and use it, uses it to a different social purpose. The e-cargo bags have been part of this process too. And we will see in an increasing sense of small scale uh, socialization and renewable electrification of the urban distribution systems, which um, will also generate large amounts of proper paid work that uh, um, allows us to get goods to and from the distribution centers, which will also be within the easy reach of the localities that we live in. It will apply in exactly the same way in terms of smart local grids. 
and the UK is way behind the the, the program on this because if if we look at the way in which the energy debate is being structured, it is still around uh, either the interests of the large energy generators, which is bonkers because 50% of the energy generated in, uh, is lost at, at power stations. Um, and in the context of nuclear, it's 70%. Whereas actually, if you move to renewable energy systems and local smart grids, it, it is much easier to see how you can cut your carbon footprint by 10% a year rapidly and radically if you relocalize the whole basis about energy generation, uh, energy distribution, and energy storage and, and sharing. The trouble with doing that is that you break the monopoly hold of the big energy cartels that currently dominate UK energy thinking. And behind the scenes on that, you, you also disrupt the power currently vested in national grid to define the issues as being what we need is as a stronger national grid. The reality, ask any physicist about electricity. Electricity goes to the nearest point of use. It doesn't go out clubbing around the country. It doesn't go out and go on the electricity motorways and high voltage transmission lines. If I'm generating it from my roof, it will go first of all into my own house and then probably into my neighbors. I could do this from the solar roof on my house, <clears throat> but if I tried to do it from more than one neighbor, I, I would be a criminal because to, to share energy currently, you have to have a full supplier license, which costs a couple of million quid. And most of us tend not to carry that sort of money around in our pockets. But actually, if you look at the smart grids that are already being delivered and constructed, certainly around North America and in other parts of, of Europe with more decentralized systems, the technology exists for delivering and sharing and storing on a localized level, not only the shift into renewable energy systems, but of integrated systems that connect heat and power, and uh, also into the ones that uh, rapidly cut the carbon footprint of providing heat and warmth and lighting security for us all. And some of the ideas that are being developed in this are just mind-blowingly inspiring. In Drammen in Norway, they are drawing uh, heat and energy from their fjords. Some complicated uh, chemistry involved in, in that as a process, but it's it, it actually provides the ability to deliver heat exchanges for uh, the, the supply the heat needs of whole towns and whole cities. But it's decentralized and it's smart and it crosses the boundaries between different energy uses, whether it's in heating or lighting or transport. All of these are part of a joined up thinking that has localized lines of accountability and more localized security. And you can find this across North America, you can find it across Europe. Uh, and if we had any sense, we'd be insisting that the World Bank fund that and only that in terms of the developing world and, and just immediately re removes all of the hidden subsidies that continue to go to fossil fuels just to add to the current problem. So that's where we are. Waste is the one other big issue that I haven't properly addressed in here. And if people want an example of where and how to start to a different approach to waste and recycling, we need to look at Norway. Norway in the 90s realized that it had a problem about plastic, the disposal of plastic waste. Uh, it, it called the manufacturers in and said, look, we're gonna, we're gonna raise some very substantial tax levies on you for everything that isn't recyclable. The industry moaned and winced, um, but were told to go away, come back with their own proposals. They did so, they came back with three forms of plastic bottles uh, that they said were recyclable. The government said, brilliant, away you go. Oh, but hang on, there's one other point. Uh, that is, it's not just that they are recyclable in principle, 
they have to be recycled in practice. And so they went back to a system which some of us can remember from our childhood, where in my case, uh, it was the, the recycling of, of lemonade bottles. And we, you could always get, they came with a deposit. Uh, and you, if you took them back to the shops, you were able to get the deposit back for, in many cases, this was this was my pocket money rather than a, a, a supplement to it. But all of this was taken as a given. Well, Norway has done exactly the same in relation to its waste. What happens is that they have introduced a series of uh, deposit return uh, banks where the barcoding on the plastic bottles is used to um, first of all, refund the 20 pence or 12 pence or 20 pence deposit that comes when you purchase the bottle in the first place. When you put it in the return bank, uh, the machine reads the barcode and gives you not cash, but a credit note for those bottles that you've returned. And those credit notes uh, act as acceptable currency in all of the local shops. So citizens love it, kids love it because it boosts the pocket money. Uh, traders love it because the money gets spent in their localities. And Norway's recycling now is the 97% of the plastic bottles that uh, circulate within their economy. We're in the UK, uh, less than 20% of the that is a recycling rate. But what is deliverable now and being delivered now is all within easy reach in a society that sets this out as an obligation and not just as an option or an individual exhortation to take some responsibility for recycling. It works on a scale that can be almost 100% if you have the leadership at a national level and the resources that come for delivering that, those outcomes at a local and community level. So for all of us, the different economics that needs to underpin our own prospects of survival involves dancing differently. This is, uh, the future is a tango, not a rave. It involves an understanding how we have to weave our lives together rather than get onto the dance floor and wave our arms and limbs around however we please. But that economics of interdependency will be based on the delivery of partnerships, uh, of sharing the gains, of delivering mutual security, of planning on a different scale at the same time as living within annual carbon budgets that reduce by 10% a year as a minimum, if in order to put back into uh, environments more than we take out. Farming communities used to understand that, that, that putting back more than we took out was a precondition for their own survival. And it is just as true today. But that sense of moving into a space that is clean and renewable democratic and accountable is the key to a more sustainable future. It may be the only key that we have uh, and the only prospects of a society in existential uh, threat that, that we have to get past and we can only get past by being quite different from how we currently are and the priorities that we currently set for ourselves. It is a massive it's a massive existential challenge to all of us, particularly to the younger generations that are coming through. But this isn't age defined. It, it is inspiration defined. So young legs and old legs, young minds and old minds all have to come together in a vision that will deliver an inclusive future for us all for our children and grandchildren, and for the ecosystems that every one of us will continue to depend on if we want to survive. It's a big challenge. The question is, are we up to it? I don't see 
the political leadership uh, at, on a, an international and national level uh, at this stage. But change comes when societies understand that that is, that is imperative. And existentially, there never has been a greater imperative that we have to face. And I just hope we're up to it. So best of luck. Thanks for staying the course in these talks. And I look forward to the inspiring ideas that come out of universities, of communities, of all sorts of age groups around the country that we share at locality level and an international level, because that's the way we can survive. Best of luck.